The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Have you ever thought to yourself how much of your life is spent in dreams? Not only those that delight or haunt you in your sleeping hours, but the ones that are present in your waking hours. Dreams of happiness or despair, bright and possible in the morning, or gray and despondent in the tiredness of evening. Dreams of romance and acclaim, or dreams of bitter violence and shocking mayhem. Just as I said, it's a ghost town. Not the way I see it, school mom. You better take a closer look. Hey, why, you crazy loco? Hold on. We're, we're going to get skin. Hang on. Our mystery drama, Ghost Town, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Lois Nettleton. From Salt Lake City, if you were driving on vacation and wanted to wander through fresh countryside, You could forget Interstate 15 into Los Angeles and choose Route 6. And if you were Sarah Conway, teacher, looking for general background for your doctorate and preparing your thesis on the gold rush that shaped American history, you might wander even further afield into that dread nightmare desert known as Death Valley. And in it, to a place beyond death, a ghost among ghosts. Well, Sheriff, still here? I got a good statement from Miss Conway. Finish the autopsy? Uh, yes. Uh, I want to talk to you about that. I'm Uh, going to want to talk to you about it, Doctor. But first, if there's any chance that Miss Conway might... Oh, no, don't don't worry about that. Night's rest, medication, supportive treatment have done her wonders. Matter of fact, she might be able to give you enough right now, Sheriff. Oh, you, you, you mean it's all right to question her? Well, that depends on whether she's up to answering. Uh, let me talk to her first. Uh, Miss, Miss Conway? Uh, Dr. Garvey, uh, oh. how do you feel? Oh. oh, as if I'd been wrung through a mincer and broiled slowly on an open fire. <laughs> so you have, in a sense. Uh, uh, how's the headache? From the accident? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that one's gone. I have another one now. What happened? Well, that's what we'd like to know. We? Uh, Yeah, uh, Sheriff Brenner is with me. Uh, Howdy, Miss Conway. We sure are mighty sorry to bother you. I wish you were all I had to bother me. Des, I mean... uh, You know who I mean. Even if I don't know who I mean. Is he dead? You mean Desmond Pogue? Yes. The man who was found with you near the car? If if that's his name, he is most assuredly dead. You sound strange the way you talk about him. Do I? Well, I gather you feel a little uh, strange about him yourself. Yes. Oh, yes. My my car? Well, I, I'm afraid that's a total wreck, Miss Conway. Oh, oh, dear. How will I get home? No need to worry about that. Your brother is driving in tomorrow from the coast. I hope you didn't alarm my family. Well, I reckon she was on the other foot, Miss Conway. They kind of alarmed us first when you turned up missing. And good thing they did. And we found you in time. In time? You were in shock. A pretty totally dehydrated, a moderate to severe concussion. Several badly cracked ribs. But I'm all right now. Well, you have some physical discomforts for a while, but your body fluids have been restored. 
The ribs are taped. Uh, the concussion doesn't appear to have been too severe, although you may have some after effects of uh, head pain, or dizziness. I wish I was sure that I won't have that all my life. And sure of what really happened. Well, now, Miss Conway, you want to try to tell us? Yes, I'll, I'll try. Oh, let me think. Oh, where was I when, when you found me? Right where your car had overturned, smack in the middle of the valley. Oh, yes, about halfway through, yes. We just passed some place called Furnace Creek. Oh, that's it. The middle of hell. The temperature there pretty near never goes below 100. And can get as high as 130 degrees plus. This time of year. Especially down that old back road you were driving. That wasn't my fault. Des Pogue made you turn off? Yes. Now, why? You know who I am. Well, we, we know you're a school teacher from Los Angeles and that you were on vacation. Yes, well, sort of. I'd been in Salt Lake... And I'd covered most of the territory south and west of there. So I decided I'd sort of head back, splitting in between them through the country I hadn't seen. Oh, uh, what'd you come down, Route 6? Mm, yes, yeah. to Tonopah. And then I came south on 95 to Scotty's Junction. And I decided I really ought to go through Death Valley. Well, anyway, I got just past a little place called Scotty's Castle. And I looked at my gas gauge. It was pitilessly hot. Hard to breathe, even. And I figured before I went through the valley, I'd better get my gas tank filled. So I pulled up to a lone gas pump in front of a kind of general store, and this old man came out. Uh, could you fill her up, please? Regular? You going on through? Yeah, I thought I would. I mean, I've never really seen it from up north to south like this. Well, I wouldn't recommend it. Not on no day like today. It is awfully hot. You ain't felt nothing yet. Time you get to the bottom of the valley, you're pretty near 300 feet below sea level. Like trying to breathe in one of them steam baths. Well, it isn't all that far, is it? Oh, not in a car, I reckon. About 100 miles. And if it gets too much for you, you could always turn off where 58 comes on across or 190. Hmm. Well, we'll see. I would like to see the whole valley. Whatever you say. But you get to the bottom, I swear you could fry an egg on the rock and never have to turn it over to get it cooked both sides. Uh, do you have a ladies' room? Right around the side of the house. Doors open, we don't use keys this part of the country. I tried running some cold water on my wrists, and splashing it on my face. My dress was literally plastered to me. So I changed into some shorts and a sleeveless blouse. I didn't feel any cooler, but at least I was drier. When I came out, the man had gone into the store. I went in and paid him and bought some cold drinks. Then I came back to the car and began my trip into Death Valley. Within a mile, I was bathed in perspiration. And I pretty much made up my mind I would turn off where the man said, get out of that sweat bath. I turned on the radio to see if maybe I could pick up a weather report. And while I was flicking the dial, my eyes were taking in the desolate country. Dry, baked, salt encrusted, sweeping away barren to the great mountains. Then, all of a sudden, my attention was held by the voice from the radio. Escaping from the high security state sanitarium. He savagely beat one guard who's still in a coma and severely injured another. Now, as sheriff of this county... Turn it off, lady. <gasps> watch it, watch it now. <gasps> Just stay on the road. Turn that squawk box off. This, this is a gun in the Six back of your again. neck. That's better. No, 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 no. Don't slow down. Just keep driving. How'd you get in my car? When you went to the ladies' room, I climbed in the back. <clears throat> It's hard to know get out back here. I'm coming up front. Who are you? Uh, I'm a dangerous nut. Didn't you hear? You mean... You mean you're the man... the one the sheriff was talking about? That's me. Des Pogue. What's your name? 
Why, it... Don't make no difference to me. All I want is just a handle to call you. My name is Sarah Conway. You're a right cute little kitten. What are you doing heading into Death Valley all alone? Well, I'm on my way home. To where? Los Angeles. From where? Well, the last big city I was in was in Salt Lake. Why'd anyone in his right mind pick this route to travel? Curiosity. Oh, yeah. You know what that did? Killed the cat, didn't it? Or maybe the kitten? What was you so curious about? I'm interested in anything that has a, a gold mining background. Oh, yeah? How come? As background for my, uh, my doctor's thesis. What are you, school teacher, something like that? Uh, no, not something like that. I am a school teacher. Tell me something. When they had me locked up, oh, long ways from here, I did a lot of reading. I'm no educated man, but uh, there was this thing I was trying to puzzle out. Maybe you being a school teacher could help. What were you trying to puzzle out? You believe in the notion of the bad seed? Like if you plant some cactus-like and the first seed ever has got something wrong with it? Why, every plant that old cactus throws from then on in would be the same? Well, if you want my opinion, I'd say that was a generally exploded theory. Oh, yeah? How come you think you know so much, little old kitten school mom? You ever hear the real Despold? I don't understand. His real name was Desperado. What are you slowing down for? Well, we're coming to uh, Route 190. This is where I turn off. Oh, no, you don't. Not now. You're taking me where I want to go. Where's that? You just keep on driving down to Furnace Creek, and then I'll tell you how to swing off to where we're going. But where are we going? Well, we're going back to Bone Dry Gulch to see if I can meet up with the first Des Pogue. The one I was telling you about? Near as I can figure, my great-great-grandfather? But that's four generations. He'd have to be dead for nearly a hundred years. Now, see, Miss Cool Mom, that's something I come a long ways to make real sure of. And if I can fix it right, I'm going to make certain sure he did die good and proper. So I could never have been... You just keep on driving, ma'am. Unless you want to join the both of us. The tall, dark man with the brooding eyes sitting beside her in the front seat seems relaxed and calm enough, the gun held loosely in his hand. But his fixed gaze and his irrational statements constantly stir the butterflies in Sarah Conway's stomach and send worms of fear wriggling along her backbone. For there is no question that Des Pogue, if that's his name, is stark staring mad. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Sarah Conway's small, capable hands are white-knuckled now from grasping the wheel so tight. For 20 miles since they left Furnace Creek behind them, the man beside her, his eyes hooded, has sat immobile. But the big, muscular hand that holds the gun is steady, and the barrel is sighted straight towards her heart. Then, all of a sudden... You can start to slow up around this bend. What for? There ought to be an old road forking off to the right, going on down deeper into the valley. I don't think there's any road along here. Of course there is. How else do you get to Bone Dry Gulch? But it doesn't show on the map. I reckon it might not at that. But the town don't either. The town? Bone Dry Gulch. I, I thought you were talking about a place. There isn't any town of Bone Dry left. I, I've read about that. And now, hold it. Ah, there she is. Right there. 
Then what is? The road. Can't you see it? Well, that's scarcely better than some old outgrown wagon tracks. I can't drive down that. Well, Miss Sarah, man, we just purely ain't gonna walk in this here heat. <sighs> Go on, start a going and turn off. But it's too steep. I, I wouldn't can't... want you to come to no harm, but I can't drive. And I can't leave you behind. And I don't want to use this gun. Less than I have to. All right. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll try it. All right, nice and easy. Don't worry. Now, what was you saying you read about Bone Dry? Oh, it isn't there anymore. The town, I mean. All it is now is a, a, a ghost town. That a fact? I only know what I read. Well, what did you read, ma'am? Well, uh, sometime after the Civil War, there, there was a gold strike here. I, I guess most of the claims weren't worth working because all the settlers except one sold out to one man. Oh, I, I, I've forgotten his name. Well, that'd be Rivette Chalmers. I guess we read the same books, ma'am. But the, the vein petered out, and the town was abandoned. Uh, uh, is, uh, is that what you're here for? Looking for gold? No. I'm looking for something a whole lot more precious. What? If I was a preacher, I guess I would say my immortal soul. I... I don't quite follow you. Well, that's just it, you see. I hope no one ever does. And no one ever should have followed down from the very first. The very first? That was a rich load while it lasted, ma'am. And no one sold out his claim who wasn't forced to. Which, at the end, was all but one. man named Ross. Oh, yes, that's right. He made the first strike, didn't he? Yes, sir. And Rivette Chalmers couldn't get him out fair and square. So he sent for the man called Desperado Pogue. <laughs> Only nobody dared call him that first name to his face. They made do with Des Pogue. Your ancestor? Who came here to dry gulch a lone hand and left as I believe the same way. He never should have planted his seed. He should have died and ended there. Instead, somewheres in a long line I came from to murder and maim and hurt and kill when his black mood is on me. The sins of the fathers. I didn't ask them to be visited on me. I want to bring them back and lay them where they belong, on his shoulders, in his black heart. And since I can't seek forgiveness from the Lord to wash me out as though I had never been. But you can't go back over a century. Now why not, if the Spirit wills? Look there. Look below us. Waiting for me, just as I said, bone dry gulch. Well, just as I said, a ghost town. Oh, not the way I see it, school mom. You better take a closer look. <laughs> you crazy! Oh, look. Watch it! We're, 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 we're going into a skid! Hang on! <laughs> I tried to grab his gun. A tire blew, and the car slewed, sliding toward the road edge. Then we hit a rock and went rolling. Only one lone clump of giant cactus kept us from tumbling all the way to the floor of the valley. I, I, I must have hit my head as we turned over. By the time I could gather my wits, the tall, dark man who called himself Des Pogue was way far down below me on the winding road. As I called, Hey, Mr. Pogue! You can't leave me here like this! Hey! He had disappeared. I climbed out and started after him. It was beginning to grow dark. And suddenly, I stopped dead in my tracks. And through the twilight, 
rising from the floor of the valley, from where the ghost town used to be, were the lights of a town that was far from dead. I could even hear the music from the saloon. I hadn't, till now, paid much attention to how the man had been dressed. But when I caught up with him, talking in the shadows behind the livery stable with another man, I was amazed to realize that what I had taken for plain jeans were not faded copies, but the authentic article. And slung around his waist was a cartridge belt and a gun in its holster. Hiding in the deeper shadows, I could hear them talk. I expected you sooner, Pope. My horse took a spill on a gopher hole, broke his leg. Understand now, I don't want anything questionable. You just have to persuade Ross to get out. I'll persuade him. But inside the law. You'd settle for a fair shoot down, of course. <laughs> Good. Well, then you might just uh, sort of make an announcement that I'm your new manager. Kind of make me legitimate. I'll get right back to the saloon and lay it out. Introduce you. That's fine. You go on in. Prepare them for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go, Mr. Charles. Oh, dearly, boy. They turned so quickly and came toward me that instinctively I started back. And as I did so, I slipped and fell right in their path. But to my stunned amazement, as they turned the corner, the two of them walked right through and over me as if I were no more substantial than the shadows around me. And in that moment, I realized that not only was I in a ghost town, but I was more ghost than anyone in it. I must have fainted. When I came to, I found I was being lifted by a tall, fair-haired young man. Uh, uh, you just take it easy, Miss Ross. I got you safe. Take you right to the buggy. Who are you? Oh, it's Chad Stevens, ma'am. Your, your daddy took to worrying when you didn't come back from town before dark and sent me on in from the mine to check up on you. <laughs> it's a good thing I did. Why? Well, I found your line right here by the stables. He, he must have got to you. <laughs> you, uh... You feel right enough to sit up on the buckboard seat, Miss Sally? Would you rather lay down on some blankets in the back? Uh, oh, no, no, I I'm all right. Uh, uh, Chad, did you say? <laughs> when I used there to tell me you don't know who I am, I know you're not yourself. I have to admit, tonight I'm not. Well, now, what's wrong, Miss Sally? How come you didn't pull out of town before dark? I got, got caught up in what Rivette Chalmers was up to behind everyone's back. Mm -hmm. Like what? He's bought himself a hired gun. Ever hear of a man named Pogue? Desperado? Oh, I surely have. If we got him in bone dry, we got just about as much as any man can handle. You know about him? How much? And he's one of the deadliest guns in the territory. And if Rivette Chalmers imported him, your dad's got his back to the wall. That's sure bad news. Uh, how do you know Pogue is here? I drove... Uh, I mean, I rode in with him. Well, from where? Well, I, well, I mean, I, I saw him ride in. And I heard him meet with Chalmers and what they're planning to do. Mm, well, I'm right anxious to hear that myself. But uh, first, uh, hey, boy, get up. Hey, you better get on back home and have a council of war with your daddy. Chad whipped up the horse that was pulling the buckboard to a steady lope. His own horse, bridle looped around a stern post, picking up behind us. I no longer knew where I was bound. But what was infinitely more important, who I was anymore. Sarah Conway, B.A., M.A., headed for a Ph.D. Or someone named Sally Ross. A century before my time headed back to meet a father I wouldn't be able to recognize with a man named Chad I'd never seen before in my lifetime. And then suddenly, we were pulling up short before a long, low ranch house built of chinked logs and adobe. And a tall, silver-haired man had greeted me 
lifted me down and called me daughter. And the two of us were sitting out on a patio where at least there was the faintest hint of a breeze stirring to help me try to gather my scattered thoughts together. So he's brought the gunslinger in. That right, little daughter? I, uh, yeah, I guess so. You told Chad the desperado was here. I said a man named Des Pogue was. Yes, well, that's him. I guess that means we're finished. You mean Chalmers is just going to steal the mine? At the point of a gun. Des Pogue's gun. The man is a killer, pure and simple. Oh, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. What do you mean, Sally? I'm... I'm not sure how to tell you. Or anyone, Mr... I, I, I mean, Daddy. Uh, could we talk this over tomorrow? Right now, I'm, I'm just kind of tired. Well, sure, sure, hon. You go get some sleep. I guess we'd all better get ready for tomorrow. Though I can't say it looks as though it's got much future in it. The man who thought he was my father led me to a room with a lovely down-mattressed bed, the checkerboard counterpane. Gratefully, I snuggled under it. And a quote kept swimming through my head as sleep waved over and engulfed me. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Evil. 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 But who went to sleep? Our teacher of today, the pragmatic, cheerful, competent Sarah Conway, or a girl born four generations before her who lived in another century, a girl named Sally. And the link between the centuries, which aspect of the man is he? The sad, guilty despogue fighting insanity and a kind of undying remorse or the smooth, suave, impersonal gun killer of the 19th century. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Night brings no relief in Death Valley, neither from the remorseless heat or from the problems of the day to come. From his window, tall, silver-haired Milburn Ross looks out into the night towards the mine that he first staked claim to and which he may have to give up. And in her bedroom, waking just before dawn, the girl in the bed lies wondering who she is. Sleep had been only a temporary relief. The layers of unfamiliar clothes, petticoats, the long, full-skirted dress that I... or the body I occupied, wore, were stifling. But the physical discomfort was nothing compared to my mental one. I sat up, preparing to get out of the bed. And suddenly, I realized a terrifying thing. The action was mine. Mine alone. The body of the girl lying on the bed still lay there, breathing gently, sound asleep. A knock on the door left me with an immediate decision. Try to burrow my way back into her body, or... But it was already too late. For the girl was stirring and answering. Yes? Who is it? It's Dad, honey. Can I come in? Oh... Uh, just, just a minute, Daddy. Let me put on some... Oh, uh, g give, me, give me a minute. Take your time, Sally. The girl was looking at herself, amazed to find herself fully clothed. As I watched, she rose and went to a small commode. She took a pitcher of water from beneath and, pouring some of it in the basin on top, washed her face quickly. Then... 
completely unaware of my presence. She almost, like, like Desmond Pogue and Mr. Chalmers the night before, walked right through me. As she went to brush her hair quickly before she opened the door. Oh, oh, what's wrong, Daddy? You dressed already, girl? Why? What What time is it? Morning. Nigh on to sunup. May I come in? Of course. Sunup? This is the dress I was wearing yesterday afternoon. Oh, you mean I slept in my clothes? <laughs> Reckon you must have. You was mighty strange last night. What happened to you in town? Daddy, hold me a minute. Oh, sure. Sure, little bird. I got you safe. No need to tremble. You're going to be all right. Just uh, tell me about yesterday. That's just the trouble. So much of it is a, a blank. What do you mean, a blank? Well, I, I guess it must have been the heat. See, I, I forgot my sunbonnet. Oh, you shouldn't have taken a chance on a heat stroke like that. Oh, I know, but my hair is so thick and it didn't seem to bother. And I, I remember seeing Mrs. Warmden and Mrs. Davis and Jean Tatum and passing the time of day. And I, I put up the rig and the horse at Joshua Trent's stable mm -hmm. and I did all my shopping at the store. When was that? Well, the sun was pretty low by then. I spent a long time looking through materials. How are you feeling then? Well, just fine, Daddy. I remember everything so clearly. Till just after I met... That... That strange man. What strange man? It was just after I got through in the general store. And I was heading back for the livery stable. The streets were all deserted and dusk was a-fallen. And suddenly... He came out of nowhere... This tall, dark man was coming down the sidewalk towards me. I wasn't paying him much heed till we got real close. And I realized he wasn't going to step aside for me. Oh. Oh. Ah, pretty young lady like you ought to look where she's going. Well, I knew where I was going. I expected you to step aside. Now, why would I do that? Any gentleman would. Who said I was a gentleman? Well, certainly nobody would now. Running right into me this way, aren't you ashamed? Nope. What? I ain't ashamed. If I'd stepped aside, I wouldn't have you in my arms. <sighs> now, this is better than being a gentleman any day. Oh, now you, you just let oh, me go. Oh, not for a minute. Take your hands off me. Not till you tell me what your name is. My name is Sally Ross. And my father's name is Milburn Ross. And he's an important man in this town. And if you don't let me go, he'll make you sorry. Oh, would he now? Well, that wouldn't be Mr. Ross of the Ross Chalmers Mine, would it? That's just who he is. And if he was to see the way you're handling me, he'd ride you out of town on a rail. Oh, is that a fact? Okay, little bird. I'll let you go this time. Only next time, I won't make it so easy. You just tell your daddy any time he's looking for a fight, I'll be waiting for him right over there in the hotel. Evening, ma'am. Hey, you. What's your name? Uh, you tell your daddy that I'm the man Mr. Chalmers just hired as the new manager of the mine. Well, I was just fit to be tired, daddy. I was just boiling inside, and I, I just felt unclean. Everywhere his hands had pawed over me. Sally, did that man do anything else to you? What? What else, Daddy? He didn't follow you to where Chad found you behind the livery stable and... No, nobody followed me. You're sure? Well, how did you faint then? That's not like you. Well, I'd, I'd forgotten my bonnet and... Maybe. But you wouldn't have a delayed reaction to heat like that. And he said he was going to be the new manager of the mine? He said Mr. Chalmers had made him that. Daddy? Daddy, where are you going? No man is going to steal my mine away from me or manhandle my daughter. I'm going to find Des Pogue and have him run out of town. I barely had time to slip through the door before he had slammed it shut and turned the heavy key. I followed him downstairs. He called out to Chad to hitch up the buckboard. I waited while he opened the safe and took out some envelopes, and he strapped on a belt and an old single-action colt. Then he headed for the stable. 
What do you think you're doing, Chad? Well, I'm going with you, sir. Oh, no, you're not. You're staying behind here to take care of Sally in case anything happens to me. Now, here, you take these envelopes. M Mr. Ross, I, son, I, I can't let you... Son, you haven't ever handled a gun. I have. Well, not the way a slinger like Des Poe can. Well, we'll hope it won't come to that. In case it does, that's my will and the deed to the mine and the combination to the safe. And this here is the key to Sally's room. I locked her in. Don't you let her out until I'm gone. Miss, Mr. Ross, please, sir, don't do it. There's some things a man just naturally has to do, Chad, even when he don't want to. Hey, boy, yeah. Long before he had started out for town, I'd scrambled into the wagon. That was one wild ride. And I was bruised and battered and dirtied as the swaying wagon threw me from side to side. Coming into the main street of town, he'd barely slowed down till we got to the hotel and came skidding to a halt. Oh, boy. Hold up there. Hold up, boy. He got out of the wagon, hitched the horse, and strode up the steps across the porch and into the hotel. I was right on his heels. There was a dining room to one side, and Des Pogue and Chalmers were sitting there, gun belts draped over the back of a chair between them. You, Des Pogue? Yep. I reckon you must be old Daddy Ross. Now, hold on a minute. I just want to know two things from you, Chalmers. Then you can go on talking or keep your mouth shut. Now, man, what are you so hard under the collar? Did you hire this cheap gunslinger to be manager of the mine? Well, now, you know we need a good manager to keep the man in line. That's my job. So you can fire him right now. Now, just a minute. If you're all riled up... All right, I... then I will. You're fired. Now, go on. Get out of town. You're mighty brave with a gun in your hand, ain't you? On your feet and start marching. No, old man. Won't work that way. See, I kind of taken a liking to that baby doll of yours. So even if I was to leave town right now, I'd be back with another gun. No, sir. Only one way I'm leaving this town. In a box. You want to shoot me so they can put me there? I ought to shoot you down like a dog. But I can't. So we'll just have to settle it outside. Strap on your gun. I'll be waiting for you. I knew Mr. Ross didn't stand a chance against a killer like Pogue. So while they were talking, I kneeled and pulled out Des Pogue's gun. Flipping open the cylinder, I shook the shells out onto the rug beneath the table, swung the cylinder back in place, and slipped the gun into the holster. I kept my fingers crossed when Pogue hitched on his belt, but he only flipped the butt of his gun a little to make sure it would slide out easy on the draw, and followed out onto the street. That's all I remember, Sheriff, till I came to trapped behind the wheel. And... Des Pogue lying out there in the dust. Yeah, the way we found you. Yeah. I'm... I'm sort of tired now. Well, that's, uh, that's quite enough. Uh, come on, Sheriff. No, no, just one more question. You know we found this gun lying on the seat beside you. That's the gun the man in the car had. The one who said he was Des Pogue. Yes. You can identify it? Yes. All right, Sheriff. That isn't one question. It's three. Now, out. All right, I'm going. I'm uh, going. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I'll join you. Some story, huh? Yeah. Now, what would you call that as a medical man? Hallucination? <laughs> I wish I knew. You know, it's a funny thing. It was a real despog, you know. I remember my old granddaddy used to talk about him. What happened to him? Oh, I don't guess anyone rather knows how he ended up. Was the man who abducted Sarah Conway, was uh, was his real name uh, Despog too? Well, now, we're going to have to check that out. There's some fellas on the way down from the state asylum to identify him right now. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of sorry to think that 
poor little lady in there had to shoot him dead. Well, you don't mean to bring charges against her. Well, I got to, just as a matter of form. I'm sure it'll be written off as self-defense. If I were you, Hiram, I'd figure out some way the gun just went off in his hand. Or either he died by accident or maybe suicide. Well, no, why? Well, you asked me if Sarah Conway's story was hallucination. I said I wished I knew. I'm going to tell you why I said that. The gun you're holding is a modern 38 caliber double action, right? I am. So chew on this. You know, guns are a hobby of mine. I qualify as an expert. The bullet that I dug out of the corpse, whoever he was, isn't made anymore today. And it couldn't have come from that gun. That bullet could only have been fired by an old Colt single action 44. <laughs> Truth is stranger than fiction. Or is it the other way around this time? And which was the fiction? Which the truth? Sometimes it's useless to look for answers. But whatever the explanation is, both Des Pogues are dead. And the one who rode with Sarah Conway got his wish. The bad seed is buried with him in the ground. And this time it cannot grow again. I'll be back shortly. There was some delay in the arrival of the men from the state sanatorium. And by the time of their arrival, positive identification of the dead man as the SKP had to be made through his teeth because by some strange chemical reaction caused by the pitiless sun and the virtual lime pit in which the body had come to rest, the flesh had disintegrated as though the corpse had been exhumed from a century-old grave. Our cast included Lois Nettleton, Ralph Bell, Ian Martin, Nat Polin, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You have my daughter completely under your spell, Mr. Uh, I don't believe we've exchanged names or cards. Ah, there's no need for formalities here. We're all children of the fates. It was all ordained. Eh? Mm -hmm. So, here's my story now. Indulge an older man. Uh, what would you guess my years to be then, sir? <clears throat> well, it's hard to say. Um, the 50s? Middle, perhaps? Oh, yeah, yeah. A long, long span of years beyond that. <laughs> and a long, long span still to go. I've a way of thinking you were led to this door. And that what I have to tell you may affect the rest of your life. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The preceding program was broadcast with the permission of the Columbia Broadcasting System.